Speaking of viruses, my computer tells me I have to update my antivirus. <sighs> the antivirus is the real virus, I think. Um, so yeah, sorry about your mind stretching. This is going to happen. My wife told me when I married her that uh, for like the first year, her brain hurt. <sighs> she also uh, occasionally bans me from using the word Marxism in our house now for 24 hours or 48 hours at a time. I can think it, but I can't say it. Um, so that's a preview of where we're going. It's kind of cool to get to do this in Arizona. A lot of people don't know, Michael was saying earlier in his lecture that, you know, he's been at this in particular, you know, speaking up about it since 2017, five years ago. Believe it or not, I gave my first talk about social justice in Arizona in July of 2017. And that's right when we had started the hoax paper project and we had kind of done this one preliminary one and identified the problem. And I told these, this audience uh, in Tucson about it and this old lady stood up in the middle of my talk and yelled, social justice is about economic issues. It's not about cultural issues. You haven't said a word about economics. And I was like, you can't say my sweet summer child to like an 80 year old. But things have changed. And in fact, we're kind of gonna talk about how and why that worked through the three lectures I'm gonna give, how we shifted from economic issues, why they were about economic issues previously, and why they're definitely not about economic issues per se now. Although we're kind of coming back to that. But we are gonna get a little bit heavy. Before I get heavy, I wanna warn you that what you are about to experience, especially in the next two lectures I give, but also the third one, I suppose, is a profoundly heterodox view of the people I'm gonna talk about, or at least a couple of them. Hegel, maybe Marx for sure. Um, the Marxists have informed me that I'm way wrong. And the scholars have informed me that I'm way wrong, which makes me believe I'm way right. Because somehow scholars have been studying Marx and his ideas for 150 years and we still ended up with 100 million people dead because they can't describe accurately what's happening. Somebody's missed something. And what I want to present, as you know, is that Marxism is a theology, but Marxism actually arises from an earlier theology and we're going to attribute that mostly to Hegel. And we're going to call that, that's the title of the lecture tonight, the dialectical faith of leftism. I didn't know if I wanted to call it the dialectical faith of leftism, which I already ingrained in my head a long time ago, or if I should call it the faith of dialectical leftism, because that's actually how it should be ordered. But dialectical leftism is the operating system of the left and has been at least since I would say the 1880s, possibly since the 1830s. Maybe we could even go back to the 1760s. The left doesn't think like other people. It has a different, to use the computer metaphor, operating system than other people. And so my main objective with these lectures is not, in fact, just to reveal or show you the ways that Marxism constitutes a theology or a theological construction rather than an economic or a scientific or a philosophical construction, but I also want to give you insight into the fact that the left has a different operating system. If you know how the operating system works, you can do something with it. You can do something about it. If you don't understand how it works, everything looks confusing. So if you thought the last few years have looked really confusing, I can tell you literally none of it's confusing when you understand that they are running a different program than you are. It's like if you've switched from a Windows machine to a, to a Apple machine and you're like, the buttons are on the wrong side. They actually think differently because they've adopted this underlying theology because that's one of the things that theology accomplishes. A theology leads you to perceive the world and interact with the world according to the way that it's structured. That's actually what they do as a functional thing. It's not just people talking about God. There's a reason that they're trying to dive into and understand God and God's nature, etc. And that is so that you construct a clear and coherent worldview that informs how you understand one idea to another. So we're gonna start off, since I wanna talk about the theology of dialectical leftism, and then use that tomorrow to talk about the, dia uh, the theology of Marxism, which is one uh, brand within that, talking about theology itself. We need to understand what a theology is to talk about how this satisfies the definition of a theology. It's not just the thing that the people at seminary do, it's actually, a, 
thing that's kind of really complicated and been explored. It's hard, uh, it's hard to define a, the, uh, a theology. Turns out it's hard to define a religion. I kind of got into all of this tangent of how I've been pursuing things by studying the psychology of religion a number of years ago. And when I opened the first book I ever read on the psychology of religion, what psychology, what does religion do psychologically? Why do people turn to religion? What, is it, what does it accomplish? What are, you know, let's take the spiritual side out and just try to understand what's it doing. They spend the whole first chapter saying why it's too hard to define religion to define religion ad- adequately in this book. This is a standard level graduate textbook or standard graduate level textbook in, in religion. Theology is kind of the same. But it, fortunately, we can start with the idea, that a really easy idea, that theology is kind of the set of ideas or system of, of thought behind a religion. So if we understand what a religion is, then we can have a pretty good guess at what a theology is. It's sort of the philosophical system that makes a religion work and how it thinks about the world and how it approaches the world and what's happening in it. So that kind of is going to bring it down to earth for us a bit. And fortunately for us, there's a, we're going to do the hard one next. Buckle up, big words are coming. But the Supreme Court has had to toss this around again and again and again and again for a number of decades because people try to make First Amendment claims. This is religious. This isn't religious. It should be in schools. It shouldn't be in schools. It should apply to the military for conscientious objectors. It shouldn't. Who gets to qualify? Who doesn't? Lots of cases. Is secular humanism a religion? The Supreme Court ruled that it is. Is communism a religion? The Supreme Court ruled that it's not a few times. So they actually have a functional definition of what constitutes a religion and what doesn't, at least for First Amendment jurisprudence. And it is a system of thought, belief, and practice. This is a very broad definition that answers fundamental questions about life and man's role in it, such that it gives rise to duties of conscience. So it's a big philosophical system, thought, belief, and practice that's organized together. It explains the fundamental questions of life, one way or another, in particular what man's role in those fundamental questions is, not too complicated, and it tells you what you're supposed to do with that as a matter of conscience. What's the right and wrong thing to do? What are your duties of conscience? It answers that question, and that is actually the litmus test that they use particularly for conscientious objection to, say, military service, who qualifies and who doesn't. What are the duties of conscience? If they, you know, does this faith take thou shalt not kill so seriously that they can't go to war, being the operative question, or are they just trying to use that excuse to drop, uh, to dodge the draft? So this is something that's actually been well thought out in First Amendment jurisprudence, but like I said, they denied to identify communism as such, which I think is a failure that maybe in the coming few years we will change. So it's a practical reason why I want to deliver these lectures as well. If this is a theology and all of this woke stuff or Marxist stuff behind it is a religion, then the United States of America and its institutions cannot endorse it. They cannot pass laws forcing people to follow those duties of conscience because people are guaranteed the freedom of their duty of conscience by the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, as well as the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, which gives us a very practical long-range goal here that, yeah, people can be as woke or Marxist or communist as they want, but they cannot operate it through the system of the state, which is going to put a big uh, monkey wrench in their gears because it's kind of hard to have a state apparatus enforcing a socialist program until it works if you can't run it through the state. They'll find a corporate workaround. They're already kind of working on that, maybe, or some other workaround. But it puts a massive, massive problem, uh, in a stumbling block in their path if communism gets recognized as a religion. You can know that by a very simple test. They've had every opportunity. All they do is try to accrue their own power. They've had every opportunity to be named a religion. And they made the case against it rather than for it because they knew that it would not be to their advantage because of the fact that they can't seize the means of state apparatuses if they are a religion. Okay, that was the easy part. (laughs) Everything from here gets hard. So what's a theology? I'm going to give you a more 
uh, uh, profound, not in the like, oh wow, that's profound, but in the deeper sense definition, it is a metaphilosophical system. So it's, we're already using big words I can't even say. A metaphilosophical system, in other words, not just a philosophy, but rather a system of philosophy that's kind of complete and it binds other systems or other lines of thought and philosophy together. In fact, it is a metaphilosophical system that binds together different philosophical strains of thought, answers to big questions, really, and orients them in a single direction. For most theologies, given the theos part at the beginning of them from the Greek for God, it orients them toward some conception of God that the theology then just tries to, do, to, to parse out. What is the nature of God? What is God? What does it tell us about these things? And in particular, what does it tell us about the biggest strains of philosophical thought? These are, get, lo- get ready for a lot of big words that end in ology, ontology, which is a theory of being. What does it mean to be? What does being mean itself? What is beingness? What does it mean to not be? What is nothing? What's the, what's the difference between being and nothing? Why is there something? That's kind of the big picture questions of ontology. Then there's small questions. What makes a chair a chair? What's the essence of a chair that makes it chair-like instead of table-like or desk-like? Those are small questions. What is a man? What makes a man human? What is a woman? (laughs) And we now know that their answer is a woman is a person who identifies as a woman, which Matt Walsh recently pointed out is circular. The technical term for this, I told Mr. O'Fallon this the other day and he got excited, is a floating signifier. In other words, it's a term that you use that points to nothing. Which sounds just funny and like they're dumb, but it's not, it's a power grab. Because if nobody can define for themselves what a woman is, they get to tell you what a woman is and you get to obey. And if they change the definition tomorrow, so be it. If the party says that the definition of two plus two is four today and that it's five tomorrow, you go along with it. So it sounds funny, but these are ontological questions anyway. What does it mean to be human? Being a very key one we're gonna spend a lot of time with. That's our first one. So metaphilosophical system, binding and orienting an ontology to a teleology. Teleology refers to a theory of purpose. Big teleological questions are why are we here? What is our purpose? What's the meaning of life? Big teleological questions. Small ones are, what's the purpose of a bottle? How do we know if a bottle's a good bottle? Because it satisfies its purpose as a bottle. It attaches these also in orients in a single direction, not just a theory of being, not just a theory of purpose. By the way, you get to forget most of the big words. I'll probably say them, but I'll remind you what they mean. To a theory of knowledge and epistemology is the big ology word for that. What does it mean to know? How do we know when we know? What is truth? These are epistemological questions. It binds and orients these along with an axiology, which is a word you're like, what? That's a theory of value. What gives something value? How do you know where value comes from? What values should we hold and why? That's the ethics branch that derives out of axiology, but really, what does it mean to value, period? Where does value come from? Why do we value certain things? That's a philosophical line of inquiry called axiology. And finally, one you know, a word, you, an ology word you know, sociology. A theology also binds and orients a theory of being, a theory of purpose, a theory of knowledge, a theory of value, and a theory of society. And I don't have to tell you what a sociology is because you know what a sociology is. And in fact, You won't forget that one because you already know that one. One more piece. So there are seven big words. We've covered six of them. Metaphilosophical system that binds and orients in a single direction an ontology, theory of being, theory of purpose, theory of knowledge, theory of values, and theory of society. And it binds and orients them in the direction of the divine. That's what's key that takes it out of metaphilosophical system, or system of science, as Hegel would have had it, into a theology. It's oriented 
not toward the mere mundane, but instead toward the divine. And this is the stumbling block that the Supreme Court trips over. Marxism denies the existence of the divine entirely, or so it says. And so since it seems to deny being purely materialist in its orientation, the existence of the divine, how can it be a theological construction? How can it be a religion? We got to understand what divine means. Divine is not an easy word to define either. If you look it up, it's a little bit frustrating. It's like that which is in accordance with God. And so you can see where the Supreme Court got stuck. But there's a comparison that we can draw from to understand what makes something divine. And that is the fundamental comparison of divine versus mundane. That which is in the world, mundane, of the world literally is what mundane means at its roots, versus that which is somehow beyond the world, beyond the merely human, is the divine. So something that's somehow transcendent. So when you bind and orient a theory of being with a theory of purpose and a theory of knowledge and a theory of values and attendant ethics and a theory of society so that you orient them in the direction of a theory of what you believe constitutes that which is beyond the merely human and worldly, you have on your hands a theology. It's a science, if you will, if you want to call it a science since it ends in ology, that understands and contextualizes other major branches of philosophical science and points them in one direction towards something transcendent and beyond. So we did a lot of big words real fast and I don't think I lost anybody. And you don't actually have to remember them because I'll remind you what they mean all the time. But I want to give you a bunch of examples. It helps to hear examples. I talked in the abstract of what a theology is. I want to give you a bunch of examples, or a few examples, not too many, of some theologies. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritties. We're not going to talk about like Reformed theology versus Arminian theology. We're not going to do that. I'm going to give you just like real big picture, simple. Don't really get offended because the first one's Christian light, real thin on the details, but a basic kind of theology in the traditional sense that Christians kind of latch into is that the nature of being is God and his creation. What is being is what God has made and God himself. The purpose that is attached to what is it, what's our meaning in life is to serve and glorify God that created us. There's some higher purpose, but that's God's business to know and not ours. So it remains a mystery what the higher purpose is, but if we serve and worship God, the promise is things will work out. His theory of knowledge is that God made us able to know things by studying his revelation, whether that's scriptural revelation or the revelation in the world. So there's truth, in fact, absolute truth, objective truth, which is caught up in the nature of God as revealed through these two different forms of revelation. Theory of value is that which is good, is that which God has named good, which been a bit of a chestnut for uh, philosophers for a while. Theory of society is something about organizing as a church and understanding who's within the church and who's outside of the church, and that the role of the people within the church is to support one another in the glorification of God. This is a very basic kind of bare, bare bones sort of Christian-shaped theology. I get it. We didn't have to be Christian with that one, actually. Classical kind of theology, where the theos is a actual transcendent deity that's beyond our full comprehension, the infinite, whatever we want to call it, I will hesitate on calling it the absolute. I'll give you another example of a theology. There is a creator. The nature of being is the same. It is the creator, the, the deity, and that which the creator has made. But in this theory, this metaphilosophical system, you don't have a wholly perfect deity that's created the world because he wanted to see what it was and deem it good, because that was his will, as you see in the Christian theology. You instead have a creator that is missing only one point, doesn't realize that it is the divine. Having nothing to compare against in the whole universe, being only that he is being itself and creative, doesn't realize that there's something else. So he creates the world for a specific purpose, 
And that purpose is to have an abject other by which he can come to understand himself as the divine and fully understand what it means to be divine. In other words, you have the divine versus the mundane, just like we did with our definition a minute ago. And to do that creation, God splits himself in an infinite number of shards and embeds himself in every aspect of his creation. And the purpose among one of his creatures, which is a thinking creature, is to figure out how to find the divine within the mundane. What divine aspects are within this desk, within this computer, within this bottle of water, within man, within the trees, within the forest, within the universe itself. And to, by understanding the spark of the divine within every aspect of the mundane, literally free that shard of the divine from the mundane prison that it's in, so that they can gather back together and eventually all gather back together, at which point the divine will realize that it was the thing it created all along and so that it is a holy, perfect creator, divine spirit that understands and has created everything in the world. Slightly different project. The teleology, the purpose of man is obvious. Your job is not now to worship and glorify God, your purpose is to, and to, to, to uh, actually humble yourself before God, to fear God. Your job now is actually to go and dif- discover the divine nature in all things so that the divine nature can actually be freed from its mundane existence. Understanding the secret divine thing hidden within everything, that becomes where knowledge comes from. You find the knowledge, the true knowledge about a thing, its divine nature, when you discover it. So knowledge is that which reveals the divine nature of every mundane thing in the universe, including ourselves. Values spring from achieving this goal. Freeing a divine shard, if you will, is good because it brings more and more of the divine together and eventually allows the divine to actualize itself. This, by the way, is an eschatological faith, because that means end-of-the-world theory, Because when the divine comes back together, everything's perfect. Because the divine realizes it's no different from the mundane, and so all of the troubles of the world fall away because they were a factor, or they were a fact of the of the fact that the divine is trapped kind of inorganically within the mundane. And you can organize a theory of society in a number of ways. You can have weird little groups and cults that do this. You could do it individually. You could try to explain society in terms of man's operation one to another to, re- to discover the divine within one another. Namaste, the divine in me recognizes the divine within you. You could also maybe create a gigantic collective that's objective is to do this as fast as possible. So you can create different sociologies. What I've described here actually is the hermetic, which is a word we heard earlier, hermeticism. It is the hermetic theology. God can't understand himself until he makes the world to understand himself as different from that which he created, and he embeds himself throughout all of it in tiny little infinitesimal shards and thinking creatures that he created. The role of man in this architecture is to free up the pieces of God from everything in his creation till God comes back together, realizes himself, and sets the world free from the the, the troubles of mortality. That's hermetic religion. That's the thousands-year-old thing that Michael was talking about earlier, where we discussed the idea of reflexivity, for example. Reflexivity is the means by which this can be achieved, alchemy. In fact, the hermetic religion is alchemy. The idea where you're making gold out of the base metals is that the gold is in the base metal. It's contained within the base metal, and if you can free the seed of gold, the shard of the divine metal, from within the lead, then it will blossom and the lead will turn to gold because you've actually freed up the divine aspect tucked within the mundane aspect. And so that's the thing. Death is mundane, life is not, so the elixir of life is the other big alchemical project. I'll give you another one. God is a perfect divine being, higher than high, absolute, if you will. And he's created creation And within creation, he's created different orders of beings, some that might be a little higher than others, and those have lorded over and, in fact, imprisoned the ones that are lower. 
You might call them angels. You might say that they've imprisoned man. You might call them gods and say that they've imprisoned man, say, in a garden where everything's perfect, but they're totally ignorant. So man is actually imprisoned by a thing that he thinks is God that isn't really God because the real God is behind that thing. And then, I don't have the right computer for this, but Mike did, and you guys all know what I'm talking about. By taking the bite out of the fruit of the tree of knowledge that's on the back of 50% of the computers in the world, <laughs> and now you're like, oh my God. <laughs> the higher level beings that are pretending to be God and creator get mad because people are going to realize as lower level beings that they're actually equals. And so it's like, we can't have that. So they kick them out of the garden where they could possibly take a second bite of that same tree, come to full knowledge, and then be as gods themselves. And so they put them in a new prison, which is the world outside the garden, by betraying them. In this kind of a theology, you might read the book of Genesis where the snake is the one telling the truth. And then God is actually a demon that got really mad because the snake undermined him and threw people out into the world of suffering. So the world, therefore, becomes a prison, and man is being held out of his full, true nature, his full inheritance, his full birthright. So the purpose is to find some way to achieve a second bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, at which point he'll have the necessary knowledge of the absolute, where he can bypass the intermediaries, realize that he is in fact as God, and that he is as equals with the other gods, but in fact, even higher than that, because he understands the full nature of the absolute, he understands his own absolute nature as well. And so he's not as the false gods, he's as the true God that's behind them. This is the Gnostic theology. As an epistemology, seeking true but hidden knowledge that's been hidden from us by those with power. It has a theory of value, achieving true and absolute knowledge to escape the prison, set humanity free, to liberate him, to emancipate him. Now I'm going to put those two together, the Hermetic example and the Gnostic example. Ontology, theory of being. Being is estranged from itself, and this imprisons being in the world. But being has created in this prison thinking creatures that can find pieces of the absolute truth to bring them together, liberate the shards, set man free, and make God whole again, at which point the world becomes whole. The secret knowledge becomes a process by which that can be done, an alchemical process that Hegel called the dialectic. And this is actually the theology that we're going to dive into. Man, being is estranged from itself. This is the cause of all suffering. The suffering gives you your epistemology. Being estranged from your true being makes you suffer. Therefore, suffering tells you something about the true nature of reality that you didn't know. When we get into the actual dialectical theory of leftism, it's that man is actually, and always was meant to be, a social animal. So the full collectivist weight of leftism comes to bear, and all of a sudden you can start to see the picture of communism written right there, and Marx's ideas somehow being grafted onto that, with the one exception, of course, that Marx clearly talked about economics all the time. So I'll tell you, in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts from 1844, which we'll spend a lot of time with tomorrow, Marx actually explains how the people who are the producers, the capitalists, actually work kind of like little gods. And they hoard the capital to themselves and estrange everybody else, not just from access to capital, but from the true nature of their being. Blah, 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 blah. So God the tyrant is now a fiction created by the lords that run over the whole show, the bourgeoisie. And they are actually the tyrants that are imprisoning man and causing man to suffer, but the suffering that they experience in the underclass through their dehumanization, through their estrangement from their own being, through their estrangement from one another, through the alienation they experience from their work and their true nature, gives them the secret Gnostic insight, the bite from the fruit of the tree of knowledge that allows them to understand that there's a true nature of man that happens to be socialist man, and that when that's achieved, 
we ourselves can be as gods. That's the theology of Marxism right there. It satisfies the whole definition, but we'll spend tomorrow on that. We're going to have to, to understand this, talk about Hegel's dialectical trinity. And so I see the, the lights going on back, back there because there's a slide. I need you guys to look at this picture a lot. I'm not going to dive into it too much. We've got to talk about the dialectic. But what you see, because we just talked about this idea of the hermetic in Hegel's very, very much the alchemist. What I need you guys to see is that hermetic idea is present here. This is not a complicated, I could have made this a really complicated diagram. I drew one out, it was really complicated. I was like, that's not going to work. So what Hegel believed is that there's this, the deity is actually the absolute idea. He was what's called a speculative idealist. So he believed that the ideas that we have actually make the world. So God is the absolute idea, the perfect, the perfect idea, the absolutely comprehensive and full idea. But the thing is, is being a hermeticist, Hegel didn't believe that that absolute idea understands itself to be the absolute idea. And so at some point in the act of creation, it created an abject other in the world, the world of nature, including man. This he called the theoretical idea and the practical idea. The theoretical idea is the theories, the ideas, what we think is the idea. It's our, it's our operating theology. It's our social science. It's whatever we think the theory of the world is. That's a theoretical idea. And it's a weird image of the absolute idea, but it's not the whole absolute idea. The practical idea is man doing stuff. And in particular for Hegel, who is a huge statist, it's organizing in a state that does stuff. So man's practical nature is realized in the state. So you have the idea as the, the theoretical idea of the absolute idea, kind of a worldly image, a mundane image, partial story, and then that gives rise to a separate practical idea. And of course, theory and practice in reality don't work. You think I'm going to do X. You go try it. It doesn't work. You're like, I had a dumb idea. You made a mistake. In fact, this is the, the same kind of thinking so far without all this absolute nonsense in the hermeticism that actual science is based upon. You create a hypothesis, and you go test the hypothesis, and then you refine your hypothesis as a result of getting it wrong. And then you do it again, and you do it again. You're trying to fix your, your sink. You think it's probably this thing. You twist that thing. Water sprays. You're like, it wasn't that thing. You fix that. You twist some other thing. Water doesn't spray. It stops dripping. You got your thing. That's the basic idea, and this is actually kind of what led Hegel to call this a system of science. But what Hegel actually did was he hammered this into Christian theology, into the fact the Christian trinity. And the reason he did that is because he's a hermeticist. Remember, with a hermeticist, everything in the world is a reflection of the true divine. It's like a shard of the divine split into the world. So it doesn't matter which religion you use. Christianity was dominant in Germany. He wanted to fuse that with German systematic philosophy. He also wanted to create a folks religion for the Germans that was separate from the Christianity he felt had been imposed upon them by the Catholic Church, and then later the Lutheran Church, and then later all the rest of the churches. He felt like it wasn't truly German in the German sense, because it wasn't truly systematic. And that's how Germans think, was these systems. And so he was had this mission. But because every theology is just a shard of the true theology, which actually has a name in Hermeticism, the Prisca Theologia, the ancient theology, which will be realized when all of the contradictions get worked out between the different theologies. Buddhism, that's one reflection of it. That's one theoretical idea of it. Christianity, that's another one. Judaism, that's another one. Islam, that's another one. On down the line, whatever you want. They're all images of the same deeper theology. And you can put them together by doing this process that he thought of the dialectic. So why not use the one that's familiar to people, that was familiar to him, that he already conceptualized it at? Because especially he was obsessed with triads, things in threes. And he saw the Holy Trinity as a thing in threes. And he said, wow, the idea is like in the world, works like the Father. And then that gives rise to the state, which is like the sun, which should make your skin crawl. And then the state organizes the society that it rules over and, or, and operates with, which gives kind of a spirit to how people act, a geist. At the world level, it's the Weltgeist, the world spirit. More locally, it's the spirit of that society. 
You've heard zeitgeist, which means spirit of the times. He wasn't that invested in the times part, but he was invested in the idea uh, every culture, in a sense, operates like a spirit that's generated because of the state conditions, which are actually the attempted implementation of the idea. And what he said is that over here in the world of the culture, people are doing all those experiments between the idea and the state, and they say, wow, we have these ideas. When we try to implement them, bad things happen. There are contradictions. Wars happen, people starve, things don't work out. We must have some of the idea wrong, and eventually these contradictions and their, their, their small dialectical re, uh, solutions or resolutions start building up until finally they get so big that there's a revolution in thought. A whole new philosophy bursts onto the scene that takes care of all the old philosophies, all the old theologies, all the other things, integrates them at a higher level, lifts them up to a higher level while destroying what they were but keeping their divine essence, and what you end up with at this higher level is a new idea. And the new idea thus generates a new state, and the new state thus generates a new society, and the process goes on and on and on. And this is the dialectical trinity. The Father begets the Son, the Son begets the Spirit, the Spirit eventually moves to create a reinvented Father. And the process goes and goes and goes and goes. So you see the arrows on the diagram go around and around and around. So now, this is a huge heresy if you're a Christian, by the way. <laughs> this is not how the Trinity works. In Christi I get it, the, the, the Trinity is a mystery, but this ain't how it works, because God is perfect and eternal. God is the I am. The verb is be. God is. For Hegel, when the theoretical idea and practical idea come back together, that's when God realizes himself. So God isn't, God becomes. God is incomplete and in the process of becoming. And the process of becoming is that Father generates Son, Son generates Spirit, Spirit regenerates Father on a higher new level. He took this idea from two primary sources, those being, well, three, I guess. I should mention Plato, because he was a Neoplatonist as well. That's why he was an idealist. He thought the perfect ideas, the forms were out there, and everything's trying to approximate those, and you're trying to get back to those through this process. But uh, his immediate German predecessor was Immanuel Kant, who had laid out the idea of the dialectic and philosophy. I'm not going to talk about Kant very much, um, but... Kant framed it out in terms of that there's a thesis, you have some idea, and then you think about it some more, and you realize that you're missing some stuff, and so you present it with its antithesis to figure out what you're missing, and you deal in the conflict of those two ideas, a thesis and the antithesis, an idea and its dialectical opposite, until you can realize how they're two parts of some bigger system that synthesizes together, a synthetic whole that captures both. Hegel saw that, Kant being kind of the pillar of systematic philosophy in Germany at the time, and he had this hermetic weird idea behind him, and he came up with, that's not quite how it works. What we have is the absolute idea, absolute idea out there somewhere in divine land, and it's like the perfect form of everything, of the entire world, of society, of everything. And it splits into its theoretical idea, which is abstract, and then it meets its contradiction in the real world, which is its negative. So he takes out thesis, antithesis, and replaces it with abstract negative. And then he says that the process that's happening, if we would say within that spirit part of the wheel, makes it concrete. It makes it actual to you. So that which is actual for Hegel is that which has be been made to be actual through this process. It's not what's really out there in the world. It's what this process has made real. So reality is becoming as well. But he stole this idea also from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who Michael also spoke about a little bit earlier. Jean-Jacques Rousseau had this idea where he was looking back into history, sorry, not back into history, sorry, he's looking out into the world during the colonial period, we're talking maybe 1760, 
He's looking out, these letters are coming back from the colonialists, the priests. They're saying, this is what it's like with the savages on our islands, and this is what it's like in Africa, this is what they're like. And they're very different. They're not like the rigid experience we have here in cities and Europe and all this. They have different concepts of time, they have different concepts of property, they have different concepts of life, they have all these different ideas. And Hegel, or sorry, Rousseau was like fascinated by this. He's all, he is like Mr. Back to Nature. And he's like, wow, they're in their more natural state of what it means to be human. And we've become too rigid here in society. But what we need to do is somehow combine those because they're not living in cities. They don't have the benefits of cities. They don't have all this good stuff that we have, but they also are freer. And so he came up with this idea that we have to, and I literally mean this, that we need to create savages made to inhabit cities. And he taught this idea and he went into this idea that you're gonna combine the idea of the natural and the uh, urbane or the cosmopolitan and you're going to make some new thing that's a better version of man. His natural instincts and his reason are gonna be brought together. Actually, his imagination, his senses, um, his reason. Uh, there's one more. He was gonna bring them together into one higher level, freed up kind of perfect man and he teaches this, and a German philosopher preceding Hegel by the name of Schiller picks this up, and Schiller assigns the German word to this concept and calls the term Alfhaben, which if you listen to my podcast, you've heard a bunch of times. Alfhaben's a weird German word. It has a multitude of meanings, as a lot of words do, but specifically, it means to keep the essence of a thing while abolishing the details or the particulars so that you can literally, Alfhaben means to lift up to raise up to a higher level. And now you look at the drawing. You take the thesis, you take its antithesis, or you take the, con you take the abstract, you meet it with its negative. You keep the essence, you abolish the particulars so that you can lift it up to a higher level. Alfhaben, I have a quote from the Science of Logic from Hegel on this. Alfhaben, it's long, I'm sorry, constitutes one of the most important concepts in philosophy. Hegel fell in love with this idea. His whole philosophy fell in love with this idea of turning savages into people made to live in cities under this concept of this Trinitarian dialectical lifting up process called Alfhaben. Alfhaben constitutes one of the most important concepts in philosophy. Alfhaben has a twofold meaning in the language. On the one hand, it means to preserve, to maintain, and equally it also means to cause to cease, to put an end to. It is a delight to speculative thought to find in the language words which have themselves a speculative meaning. The dialectic is actually appearing in the meaning of the word Alfhaben. There's the part you keep, there's the part you get rid of, and then you lift it up to a higher level of understanding. As Kant put it, you put the thesis, you put the, synthesis, uh, the, the antithesis, and you get a higher level synthesis. This is Hegel was enchanted by this, and he built out, as you see with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I just talked about, a whole theology. In fact, it's the Hermetic theology based off of this idea. But it's also Gnostic. And the reason it's also Gnostic, even though they're not compatible, what would you do if you were a dialectical magician, an alchemist, and you had two opposing ideas that are kind of similar and you wanted to turn them into one thing? Daha, you would synthesize them. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. The reason it's also Gnostic is because it all depends on there being an absolute idea, an absolute truth, an absolute conception that becomes knowable when the theoretical and the practical ideas have no distance left between them. This process then isn't a spiral through history like this, you know, where you're going around in the same size. If you've ever seen that video with the earth and it's what's it really look like and it shows the, the sun is moving and all the planets are going around it and it's spiraling through and it, you know, the orbits of the planets don't change size, so it's like just a round spot. It's not like that. This is like a drill. It's getting smaller and smaller. Every time that goes around, the triangle gets smaller. And it goes around again, the next revolution, it gets smaller. And eventually, there's no distance between idea and state. The theoretical idea and practical idea unify, at which point the absolute idea realizes itself, and now you have a perfect idea. And what comes out of it is a perfect state that's no different. And that perfect state gives rise to a perfect society where there are no contradictions left that would move the dialectic any further. And you reach literally what he called the end of history. Of course, Francis Fukuyama famously wrote a book in 1989 when the Soviet Union fell called The End of History. This is why. The goal is to get to the end of history, at which point the 
deity realizes what it is. Now, my point isn't to say whether or not this is right or wrong. I'm not even going to necessarily argue. I already said it's a heresy, which it clearly is. My point is, it is blatantly a theology. In fact, Marx said it was a theology. Marx criticized Hegel by saying all he did was create a theology, a dialectical theology. So Hegel's dialectical trinity, I already gave you one of the punchlines. His ontological exploration is what's the nature of being? Well, you've got being and you've got nothing. Wow, those are dialectical opposites. How do you put them together? The absolute negation of the the abstract idea of being at its highest level of abstraction, the absolute negation of that is nothing. Well, how do you put them together? Well, that which is became that which it is. This was just plastic until it got turned into a bottle and became a bottle. This was just a bunch of parts until somebody put it together and it became a computer. You were just a guy until you learned how to do plumbing and you became a plumber. Everything's in a process of becoming. There were no plumbers at one point. Somebody started doing plumbing. They became plumbers. This is the nature of the deity because it's also the expression of the theoretical and the practical coming together to be the absolute or to become the absolute. That which we think about the world in our best theologies, philosophies, sociologies, ideas about how the world works, compared with how it's actually going, and we're going to refine that process again and again and again to we awaken the absolute. Of course, he also hammered it in because of his belief, his hermetic belief in the Prisca Theologia, the ancient theology, the one true theology that all the other theologies are just images of. He hammered it into the Holy Trinity and created a new becoming trinity rather than the trinity of being in the Christian theology. And it looks kind of scientific. Because it would be if it wasn't scientism. Scientism is something different. Scientism is the idea that the theory is ahead of the experiment when you have a scientific process. We'll come back to that. But this is actually scientism. But I actually refer to it as, you could call it, scientistic alchemy or scientific Gnosticism. I've used different words. But it is a dialectical faith. Especially because he hammered it into the Holy Trinity as just part of the broader ancient theology, Prisca Theologia, that he was trying to recreate. In fact, recollect. Remember when Michael was talking earlier, if you recall, he was talking about how there's this idea that we're going to look inward into ourselves to understand. We don't have to look out to the world. We're going to look into ourselves where we're going to remember our true nature, our absolute nature, our divinity. We're going to recollect or recollect, I should say. We're going to remember what that is because it's the true theology. We're going to remember our divine essence that's been caged up in a mortal coil. This is a theological construct. This is what Hegel's about. I said it as recollect a minute ago because that's the goal. When you do it, you free up the shards of the divine. The divine shards go out and they recollect into the absolute. Isn't it fun when you find a speculative word that is like a pun involved in it? But as you see, and I said it to make your, 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 your blood curdle, bones chill, in the Trinity, you see this idea that The father gives birth to the son, and the son for Hegel is the state. Now, if I made the diagram more complicated, what I would have done is off to the side of the state is nature, and then the valuable part of nature is the state, which is man put into practice. All of nature is actually the mundane world that's created, but the state is the practical part. But nevertheless, let's not mince any words here about what this really meant for Hegel, and if you guys will, the next one, the short one, Hegel said... In accordance with this diagram, the state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. The state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. He wrote that in the philosophy of right. So what is Hegel's theology's goal? It is to unalienate or unestrange man from his more divine nature, somehow using the state as the savior figure. The means of doing this is this dialectical process where the ideas of man give birth to 
the divine ideas that exist on earth, the state, which then will manage affairs and create a spirit of society that will realize the contradictions in this dialectical opposition, lift it up to a higher level while keeping its key essence and abolishing the unnecessary particulars and take us around and around the shrinking spiral until we get to the eschatological end of history where the idea becomes perfect, thus the state becomes perfect, thus the society becomes perfect, and the people who live in it live in a utopia. Spiraling toward the so-called omega point. So God is the Alpha and the Omega, not for Hegel. We're getting to the Omega. We're going to make the Omega. I'm not trying to focus on how it's a heresy, but it's good to repeat a lot of times since it's colonizing lots of churches, that it is a blatant heresy. Now, Hegel called this nonsense a system of science, and like I said, it kind of looks like a science, but there's a trick here. Not a, I don't even want to blame him for this trick, because it hinges on it being written in German, System der Wissenschaft. Wissenschaft didn't mean what we think of as science in 1807 when he wrote The Phenomenology of Spirit. We hadn't quite figured out science yet. We hadn't quite understood the electricity and magnetism where the real scientific revolution finally took science into its modern era, what we understand as science today. They were trying to work out in 1807 what science actually was, but they knew that it meant knowledge. And Wissenschaft means knowledge in German. It's a broader concept than we think of as science. So he calls this a system of science. He thinks it's scientific. And I said already how you can think it looks scientific, but it's not. What he did, and you will hear lots of echoes in, in what I'm about to say to what Michael was talking about earlier, is he separated, especially the quote from George Soros that was up there that he read, he separated into two levels his system of science. There's higher science and lower science. Verstand, which means understanding, and Vernunft, which means reason, as it gets translated. So Vernunft is your theoretical idea. It's the image in men's heads of the absolute. And Verstand is men's attempt to comprehend or understand the practical idea as it is in the world now. This gets understood reflectively. In other words, as a speculative idealist who thought that the idea is the centerpiece, what Hegel thought you did was that you observed the world, there's your first stand, try to understand the world through observation, senses, whatever, and then you imagine it against theory and try to recollect what the divine absolute theory would look like, and that's where you find your contradictions and why things aren't going, and that's actually the movement of the dialectic. So in other words, the people that move the dialectic are Gnostic because they think they have some sense of some glimpse into what the absolute idea should be, as the explanation for why what we observe is not what our theory says we should observe. But like I said, this is scientism. It is not science. This is 1807 attempt to define and lay out what science is before science had come into any maturity. It puts the theory first, right? So what Hegel's saying is that, yeah, we're going to take our theory and we're going to look at the world and we're going to see how it doesn't work out the way we think, but what we're going to do is we're going to say that the practical part is wrong, not the theory is wrong. We're going to lift up. We're going to keep the theory intact. In fact, we're going to keep the system of the theory intact. The metaphilosophical system is going to stay intact. And we're going to try to recollect the absolute knowledge hidden behind it to understand the theoretical idea more clearly and lift it up to a higher level based on the contradictions and what we observe. So rather than adjusting Coming up with a new theory when we're wrong, we're now going to try to flip it over the other way and put Vernunft ahead of everything. The system itself, Hegel's own philosophy, is science. You didn't know his middle name was Fauci. <laughs> he is the science. But this is the opposite of science. I got a quote from Richard Feynman, probably the preeminent physicist of the 20th century, funny guy. And he has a very eloquent video, I hope you all go look up at some point, where he says that all of science can be contained in a single idea. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And then he says, and that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't matter how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't matter what his name is, Hegel, Fauci. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's real science. 
You take your idea, you ram it into the world, then you humble yourself before reality and change your idea. Not you arrogantly assert that your idea was embedded in a correct system of absolute knowledge that you're now going to speculate upon, which means reflect upon, until you come up with some synthetic nonsense where you get to keep your theory intact, which is scientism. Hegel says something about this, and this is how we can know for sure that he's a Gnostic. He says, to quote from the Phenomenology of Spirit, the true form in which truth exists can only be the scientific system of it. To contribute to bringing philosophy closer to the form of science, the goal of being able to cast off the name love of knowledge, Leiba sum wissen, and become actual knowledge, I can't say German things. Verlika, I don't know. Actual knowledge is the task I've set for myself. So a very controversial but correct philosopher, German philosopher by the name of Eric Foglin, explained that this, very clearly explained that this is actually the shift, philosophically speaking, from the old days, out of philosophy and into Gnosticism, rendering Hegel a Gnostic. He says it right there. The philosophers, if we go back to the Phaedrus, which was Plato describing a conversation between Socrates and Phaedrus. Phaedrus asks, Socrates, how do we know what's true? How do we know what knowledge is? Can we know knowledge? Can we, what, do we, what do we call these people? Do, do we call them Sophia, the wise? And he says, no, the closest we can get is lovers of wisdom, philosophia philosophers. Because absolute knowledge is reserved for the gods and we don't have access to that. We can't have that. Gnosis is reserved to the gods. All we can do is love knowledge and pursue it. We can't claim it. And if you look at the German here, I know it's small letters, all Hegel did was took this classic well-known philosophical idea of the key Gnostic error and translate it into German so normal people wouldn't know it was happening. The goal is to cast off the name love of knowledge, which he wrote in German, to cast off philosophy and become Gnostics. Literally what he wrote in the preface to Phenomenology of Spirit. The man's a Gnostic. So we have this weird Gnostic alchemy as a theology hammered into Christianity posing as science, and that's what Hegel gives us. What Foglin actually said about this is as if a thinker attempts that he's not advancing philosophy, but if, uh, he's abandoning, abandoning it to become a Gnostic. Hegel conceals the leap by translating philosophia and gnosis into German so he can shift from one to the other by playing upon the word knowledge, by playing upon a pun, which he then splits into two sides, Wiesen for knowledge or Wissenschaft, for science, that he then splits into Vernunft and Verstand, which are just his dialectical pieces, where his theory is true knowledge, or the pathway at least to it. And this gets framed out very importantly, as we'll hear when we talk about Marx, in terms of another classic philosophical dialectic, which is how do we understand kind of another aspect of the nature of being, what we are as subjects in an objective world, as conscious, aware beings, thinking beings. What does it mean to be the thinking being that advances the dialectic? And this is another dialectical triad where you now have in the place of the idea, you have the subject, the creative thinker that's creating the idea. And in place of the world, the practical idea, you have the object, the objective world as it is. And the synthesis or the making concrete of this process of the third spot, the spirit spot of the subject object dialectic for Hegel then is one of their favorite tricks. I don't know that he actually did it, but they like to just take the two ideas and hyphenate them like they're one idea and now they found the thing. Paulo Ferreri, the educator guy that we'll talk about more later, tried to do this with teachers and students and said we needed to have teacher students. That was the dialectical synthesis, was teacher students. I'm like, good job. <laughs> Here what you actually have, though, is the subject who creates an object. What makes people people is that they are subjects 
who through their thought processes and then activity on nature create objects. Hegel said that the root of all value, so here's your theory of value, your axiology, is productive work upon the nature's, on nature's raw materials. So the theoretical idea that the subject perceives gives him an idea of what he wants to make in the world, then he makes the thing in the world, and so he becomes a subject object. He becomes a subject that's able to create objects and understand himself as a thing that creates objects. In other words, as a creative subject who's producing value and bringing it into the world. Which, by the way, is the only thing Marx said that Hegel got all the way right, was that value comes from work done on nature. The final piece that I really want to talk to you about with Hegel is the one I already mentioned, the master-slave dialectic, which was the inspiration that he borrowed from Rousseau, to whom we're going to turn next. So he gets the concept of Aufheben. Hegel looked at this idea from Rousseau, and he literally, kind of a racist guy in 1807, looked at this idea and he thought, yeah, we should be colonizing because we want to put that dialectic of the civilized versus the savage and let it work its way out toward the savage made to inhabit cities. We're going to free up the intuition. We're going to free up the feelings. We're going to free up the emotion of the overly burdened, reasonable, legalistic man in society. But we're also going to elevate the people we colonize by bringing them aspects of reason and teaching them to hone them and to create the savage made lived in, to, to live in cities where he got the word Alfhaben from Schiller in the first place, which defined his entire process. And the goal is actually of this theology is to unestrange the absolute and thus to allow God to realize that God is God. And when God realizes that God is God, God will become so sovereign and we will enter into God's kingdom. The eschaton, the end of history, will be achieved and the kingdom will arrive. Kingdom come, thy will be done. No separation between earth and heaven. So now we have to turn to Rousseau, because we now we know what a dialectic is. I told you, it's an operating system. They think completely differently. But we're talking about not the dialectic. And Hegel, it turns out, probably wasn't a leftist. We're talking about dialectical leftism. That's what today is about, the dialectical faith of leftism. So we have to understand leftism, and leftism comes from Jean-Jacques Rousseau in its modern form. I'm not going to say that there's not leftism before that. I just say that in the modern form, it literally comes from Jean-Jacques Rousseau because the word we use left and right, these words that we use, literally comes from the French Revolution where the Rousseauian side lined up on the left in the Estates General calling for change and revolution and the side on the right defended the clergy and the ancient regime. The words left and right literally come from the first practical application of Rousseau's philosophy, which took place in the French Revolution, depending on which side the people lined up on. So it makes every bit of sense to call Jean-Jacques Rousseau the father of modern leftism. The goal of leftism in general, I'm going to give it two fundamental pieces, but the, the more common one that people say, if you just had to make it simple, is to abolish hierarchy. Hierarchy is bad. Hierarchy orders society. It's not fair. We're going to abolish hierarchy, so everybody's going to live as equals. But that requires economic socialism, and it requires breaking free the true social nature of man so that it can function. The second is, with leftism, is the objective of transforming the world. In other words, progressivism. The belief that you can transform the world. So this is where we come back to this idea that we talked about earlier today with the, the idea that the Gospel of John begins with an assertion of the Logos as reality. I'm not going to go all the way to the pathos yet, but we'll get there. The world as it is has an order. Christians, Jews, other religion people would say, Religious people would say that that order is divinely ordained and created. Total naturalists might say, well, we don't necessarily know why there's order. We just know that there is order, but fine. There's certainly an order to reality, and bucking up against that is ridiculous. Reality itself is sovereign. We could agree, I think, except in, I think it's John 1.18, but I don't remember my verses perfectly. We could agree, except to that point where the Word became flesh in the body of Christ, we could agree that the idea that reality is completely sovereign is a point where kind of classical naturalists and Christians and Jews all agree. 
Well, if reality is sovereign, what you do is you accord yourself with reality and flourishing takes place there. So you start to outline the ideas of these pieces of a broad theology. But if you don't think reality is actually sovereign, but is rather a prison or a limitation upon you, then you try to transform reality to accord to you and your wishes. That transformation, and we're going to use the word transform a lot, and you heard the word transform a lot from Mike earlier, that word transform is fundamental to leftism. It is not humility before what is, it is arrogance to believe you can reorder what is to serve you. And if you take a bite of the fruit or tree of knowledge, you will become as gods to reorder reality as you will. So I make the Gnostic reference from Genesis again. Why? Because what you perceive this as, as a leftness, as a leftist, is what uh, another philosopher, Martin Heidegger, referred to as Gevorfenheit, the flungness or thrownness of being. You've been thrown into this world. You didn't want it this way. You didn't ask to be born. You didn't ask to be born into the society you were born into. You didn't ask to be born into the conditions you live in. You didn't ask to be born as a man or a woman. You didn't ask to be born black or white. You didn't ask for any of it. You were thrown into this world and it sucks. <laughs> but you can transform the world to make it better. And this dialectic of Hegel attaches onto this perfectly because it is a method of transformation. There could be other means of, trans of transformation or changing society, like actually according things more accurately. We talk about the ideas of men and women. We're definitely different. Whoa, getting thrown off YouTube. <laughs> but we are genuinely more alike than we are different when it comes down to it. So we can find out what the realities of those things are and we can accord ourselves to how reality actually operates and we can figure out how we want to behave in accordance with what's real. And theologies, like say the Bible, give at least a really darn good approximation of that if you want to take an outsider's view and if you want to look at it from within, they give the perfect view of it. And it's our job to figure out how. Same with races. Way more similar than we are different. Way, way more similar. So racism doesn't make any sense. That's a different way that you can overcome something like racialist ideologies. You don't have to use a dialectical process of putting them next to each other and allowing conflict to come up so that they average out between one another. They can share a culture without averaging out in a dialectical conflict to lift up to a higher level where there's savages made to inhabit cities. So what Rousseau, as a leftist, was looking at, that wasn't Rousseau stuff, that was leftism. What Rousseau was looking at as the father of leftism is basically that the society in Europe that he inhabited had become too rational and too legalistic. It was cold. It didn't have feeling. It didn't have emotion. The imagination was stifled. All this legalism, all this reason, having to be reasonable all the time, having to give evidence when somebody asks you why you think something, that just holds you down. You have to be rational all the time. You can't just, oh, I feel this way, so it's true. I feel it really strongly. I'm sincere, so it's true. So we wanted to elevate this more back-to-nature, noble, savage side of humans and in, elevate instinct, elevate emotion, elevate imagination, get back to that state of nature, noble, savage, without losing the benefits of society. would be more warm, but not as messy as the savages, we'd mix them together. And the savages made to inhabit cities, Alfhaben. And that's again going to happen by elevating emotion, the senses, and imagination, not just reason. In other words, particularly, and here's where we hit it, pathos. The three classical Greek modes of persuasion were logos, pathos, and ethos. So you can appeal to logic, the order of reality, and John 1 begins that way in saying that that's what's up. You can appeal to feelings, or you can appeal to what's right. Those are the three modes of argumentation according to the Greeks. And Rousseau wanted to bring back emotion. He wanted to appeal to feelings, sincerity. He wanted to elevate those. And so we're seeing the possibility for a religion of pathos if this became a religion. Guess where we're going? The reason he thought that society operates the way that it works and how we can free ourselves from its constraints 
is through what he called, and it's the only other point of, of Rousseau that I'm going to discuss tonight, is through what he called the social contract. Social contract theory is a big deal. It's a huge idea in sociological theory, how society is organized and why it's organized that way. He wrote an entire book on it in 1762 called The Social Contract. The idea of the social contract is that we all kind of, whether we've been flung into our society or not, we all kind of have to play by the rules. Libertari excuse me, libertarians, by the way, get really upset. And they don't like the idea that we didn't agree to, say, pay taxes to stay good with our citizenship. And then leftists always argue back and say, well, it's part of the social contract. And this is why. There's this idea that we all have an unwritten contract that defines what the society is, and we're all bound by that contract, which he was thinking of, he's calling it a contract, he's thinking in terms of this legalistic structure. Part of it actually requires, in European society, people to be reasonable. You have to be reasonable. You have to give the legal argument. You have to clearly lay it out. You can't just feel some way and get it. We have this idea of a social contract, contract that restrains society and that's how society is actually or, uh, organized. We all agree to it, even if we've never heard it. We just kind of pick it up from the air, or from the water, as it were. Well, when this isn't perfect, and now we start to hear where that dialectic thing is going to graft right in. When this isn't perfect, it estranges man from himself. He can't be in his state of nature. He becomes too cold and rational and legalistic. And he's bound by the chains of society itself, by other people's dumb ideas as Maybe Rousseau would have thought that they were when he wasn't getting his way. So this establishes what the Romantics kind of experienced or thought of as a prison of being. You're in prison because society isn't organized the right way. But you can change this. It's a social contract. You have a different society. You have a different social contract. You can reorganize it. In fact, it's socially constructed by a bunch of agreements, tacit or explicit, between people that this is how we're going to resolve disputes. This is what we're going to do in different cases of conflict. This is how we're going to speak to one another. This is how we're going to speak to one another depending on who you are, older or younger, for example. Respect your elders. This limits, however, for a romantic or for Rousseau, it limits, it puts a limitation on your nature of being on your range of subjective experience. You might feel X, Y, Z, and you can't say X, Y, Z because it's not appropriate. You, can't, you may feel like you are a woman, but you were born with twig and berries. <laughs> and it's only a social construct that says you can't change that. And we just went from 1762 to 2022 in about four seconds, and it made sense. When this is right, however, because Rousseau was a leftist, when the social contract is right, everybody gets to actually attain maximum freedom. People aren't being arbitrary, arbitrarily limited. They aren't being kept out of the full expression of their being. They can't maybe be everything they want to be but they can be the maximum that they can be. When you get the social contract right, everybody's agreeing on the right things, everybody's got the right idea, and everybody's sharing the idea, but that only arises when we realize that we're actually intrinsically social, and this is where the tendency to abolish hierarchies and to uh, be socialist comes from within leftism. The social contract can guide us, and when we actually are all in a position we're all in a position where the social contract works as best as it could for all of us, then we hit maximum freedom. So what Rousseau said is that the way that we achieve more freedom, more emancipation from the prison of being, is by willingly giving up some of our freedom for the greater good. And that will maximize freedom. But this, at the end of the road, makes you realize that you have to think constantly in terms of what the entire social collective would be most benefited by in terms of your own behavior. A reasonable analogy to say that this isn't total crackpot ideas. Traffic. We all agree on traffic laws. We all participate and abide by most of the traffic laws, some of which we recognize as somewhat hilarious suggestions. <laughs> but in general, we follow the traffic laws. We stay between the lines. We use our turn signals. 
We stop when we're supposed to stop. We go when we're supposed to go. And this creates a system of order on the road where cars crash less than if you've ever been to some countries that have a very different traffic system and you're used to the order that we have here. You're like, holy crap. <laughs> this looks a lot more like those blood cells and those videos that you had to watch in biology class crashing around through the arteries. <laughs> holy moly, how do they not kill each other? I've spent a fair amount of my time in China, actually, and like sometimes people are just going the wrong way, and the laws are different. Somehow it kind of works. So there are reasonable times at which we might agree, by some means or another, to limit some of our freedoms to make something work better. I don't know that we actually attain maximum freedom on the road by abiding by traffic laws, but you can see where the idea might kind of make sense to somebody. Calling it the achievement of maximum freedom is probably not a great idea, but you could say, well, people getting in car accidents and things clogging up and the traffic not flowing well, et cetera, limits your freedom in the road. And so in some sense, maybe there is an optimum that we find in this trade-off. So it's not a totally crackpot idea, but we do have, when we're talking about a total system of societal organization, which involves not a very purpose-oriented task of everybody or many people as possible getting safely from A to B, in a constrained system of traffic, but rather the entire operation of society and everything everybody wants to do, with all of its much higher level of complexity, it might not be a better way to do things. And what we end up with here is a negative dialectic, which sounds an awful lot like magic, and which is what Hegel actually laid out. A negative dialectic. The abstract is hit by its negative, and that gives rise to the concrete. So you're always doing a process of negation, of being negative finding the opposite thing. So for Rousseau, we achieve, we achieve maximum freedom by giving up some of our freedom. And when you think about that, you're like, wait a minute. How many things in the world actually work that way? That you get more when you give some of it up. I understand I'm in a church. Tithe your pastor. <laughs> but this isn't a prosperity gospel, but that might be. Give some of yours up to the collective and we're going to get a lot more. Now imagine if you replace... The collective with God, you have a prosperity gospel. What Rousseau is actually mapping out here, we talked about savages made to live in cities or inhabit cities. In leftism, what we're actually reaching into is how do we attain the objective of individuals made to inhabit a society? And he said that you maximize your freedom when you spend time thinking about the social contract and willingly giving up some of your freedom to maximize freedom overall. And so again, that dialectic is present here, that's visible here, and Hegel's organization of society becomes more and more visible here. But Hegel was only so into Rousseau, but somebody else we're going to talk about a lot tomorrow was really into Rousseau, Karl Marx. And the goal of the dialectical faith of leftism then is easy to state. It is to create through this dialectical process, which is a combination of hermetic and Gnostic ideas that don't have to be hammered into necessarily Christianity, but are hammered into a trinity that's not that far off from it, except in a heretical becoming form instead of a form where God just is and is complete and total as he is. We now have the idea that we're going to build a perfect society by reconditioning individuals themselves so that they're made to live in society, while reconditioning society so that it's built to suit the individuals. Which sounds, again, like one of those circle things. But it's a spiral, don't worry. We get to the perfect part at the end, and it'll work this time. The dialectical faith of leftism, then, is, follows from this exactly. So I want to give you a little bit of context so we can bridge the gap to Marx, but we can state the dialectical faith of leftism pretty easy, easily now. It is the belief that this is how the world works, that this is the program. This is the overarching theology. You take something like Hegel's theology and you graft in the leftism of Rousseau, which partly inspired Hegel in the first place, and boom, you now have a leftist theology where the collective, in some sense, stands in place of God. Now, right after Hegel died, I said Hegel probably wasn't a leftist. He might have been. I don't know. I think it's ambiguous. I don't think it applied, really. I mean, it had, the term had been defined, but I don't think it was clear. He definitely wanted to transform the world, but he wanted to transform the world through the ideas, and he believed that Napoleon was great. 
Napoleon was the ideal figure that sweeps up the changes in history for him. Right after he died, Hegel's kind of school of students, if you will, split into two branches almost immediately, the young Hegelians and the old Hegelians. I think they were called this, though I'm not 100% sure because of the average ages of the people involved in them, but I'm not positive about that. The young Hegelians were progressives. The old Hegelians were Hegelian with the dialectic, but super conservative. In fact, the old Hegelians in 1830-ish, five-ish, believed that, in fact, the Prussian state of the time had already achieved the perfected society, and so the goal from there would just be to spread it around the world through, like, nation building or something. Uncomfortable silence. <laughs> Maybe you know some rhinos that are old Hegelians that are in office right now, and why they're so similar to leftists. The young Hegelians are like, I think, right in this argument, bull crap. Lots of problems still. We've got to fix those. We have definitely not achieved the perfect society, so we can't possibly have the perfect idea. I think they're probably right. I don't think that German philosophy, 1835, had perfect philosophy. I don't think we'd figured everything out yet, and I don't think anybody would think that we'd figured everything out yet, except for some very arrogant Germans or neocons. Remember, Francis Fukuyama's book was titled The End of History because liberalism was the correct dialectical end of history, and we just had to spread liberalism around the world through nation building. The most important in our discussion of the young Hegelians was Feuerbach. Feuerbach was actually mentor to Karl Marx, but most importantly, according to Karl Marx, he made the only true advancement in Hegel's otherwise kind of broken dialectical program, which otherwise, besides its spiritual aspects, had the picture basically right. And what Feuerbach was, it was an ardent materialist, an atheist. Feuerbach did not believe that this absolute idea as God part could possibly be right. That there has to be something else, that there is no God, we're talking, it's like 1840-something in Germany, 1830-something in Germany. We are, no, God is dead. We don't have that anymore. That's the view. So that part's got to be crackpot, and he was a theologian. In fact, Feuerbach called him a theologian. So we're going to be materialist about how we go about the dialectic. And this is what Marx picked up to create his system that later got named dialectical materialism, which is the name for what we call Marxism. And we're going to do the exact same dialectic, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, the exact same dialectic in the material realm, but Marx took Feuerbach's materialism further into the economic realm, not just atheist materialism, that the material is all that there is, but also social and economic materialism, that material conditions are actually determinant upon people's lives. Material conditions tell you what life is like. So we now want to know, though, where Marx kind of gets his idea, and we know what the dialectical faith of leftism is. It's the belief that this is going to work, that the world works this way, and that the dialectic can transform it eventually to something like a utopian state. They argue about how utopian they are. They argue throughout history about whether they're utopian or not. Marx claimed he wasn't a utopian, but somehow there was still a perfect society at the end of the Marxist rainbow that wasn't a utopia per se, but I think his argument for that, and certainly it's an argument that was made later, is it's not really utopian because utopia means no place or nowhere in Greek, and you can actually get there. So it can't really be a utopia. I, I don't know if that's his actual argument, but he actually hated the utopian socialists um, who he thought were crackpots, and some of them were. One of the first people to use the word socialism, as a matter of fact, I read just the other day, uh, believed, maybe the first person to use the word socialism, believed that we would end up having kind of a perfect socialistic commune and we wouldn't have to do any work because we would tame things like the lions and the whales and the elephants to do the work for us. <laughs> and he actually sold people on this crackpot idea. And I can understand why Marx would say that that's stupid if that's what he was thinking of. Um, because it's stupid. But the dialectical faith of leftism, which is our point, is that we can transform the world into a social utopia through a dialectical process. And the dialectical process is that we're going to have some conception of a theoretical idea, some conception of a practical idea. Those things are going to play out in a realm of contradiction 
It's going to have something to do with subject and object. Those things are going to play out in a realm of contradiction to where we now realize a higher level of society where the theoretical and practical become closer together. For Hegel, it was a theoretical idea, and the practical idea for Marx, it was theory and practice. So obviously he was thinking of something completely different by calling it something way different like theory and practice instead of theoretical idea and practical idea because he wanted to get away from the idealism and not call it an idea. <laughs> totally different thing. So since it's a theology and a faith, the dialectical faith of leftism that has to do, it's a, it's a theology and a faith of leftism, it has two properties. Number one, because it's dialectical, not only does it use the dialectic, it changes itself dialectically. If we had an argument between different types of Baptists, like Arminians and uh, Reformed, we had an argument between them, they're going to use actual theological methods relevant to baptism to figure it out. They're going to work it out within the metaphilosophical system that defines and orients everything. Those are the means, the methods, that's what gives it all meaning. Well, if you have a dialectical faith, you're going to modify your faith accordingly, dialectically. So everything leftist moves dialectically. So if you don't understand that they have this take a thing, collide it with its opposite, somehow take those and think about them in terms of the bigger picture, which is the theory you started with, and thus arrive at a synthetic bigger picture, like that men can be women sometimes, but not always, and the people who know the theory because they have the special knowledge because they took a second bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge get to tell us what it is and when, then you can actually transform the world in accordance with that. That's the dialectical faith of leftism, and it's going to change dialectically every time. So Marxism is going to change from Hegelianism by dialectically synthesizing in materialism. Marxism is going to change into cultural Marxism by dialectically synthesizing something else in. Cultural Marxism is going to transform into critical Marxism by dialectically synthesizing something in. Critical Marxism is going to transform into identity Marxism by, and I can tell you what it is, by dialectically synthesizing identity politics in. Keep the Marxist essence, get rid of the particular of the economic theory, move it into the cultural domain, move it into the critical domain, move it into the identity domain. That's going to transform into woke Marxism by dialectically synthesizing, keeping the keeping the general thrust, but getting rid of the particulars and critical consciousness and identity politics isn't going to be enough. It's now going to be a Marxist theory of knowledge that you awaken to as a woke person. So it's going to move dialectically. It will change dialectically, which makes it easy to predict once you kind of understand the exact image that's up on the screen in front of you. When you get that image, it's going to change in, according to this theory and so you know that it's going to go from something that's idea-based to something that's material-based to something that's culture-based to something that's idea-based. Like it's going to start with idealism in Hegel, and it's going to move to materialism in Marx, and it's going to move to cultural issues for the cultural, critical, and identity Marxists, and it's going to move into knowledge, which is an idea again. When you get woke, and then you know where it's going, back to the material. We already heard the big S word that is the next material push, sustainability. Then it's going to go somewhere cultural, like a global citizen consciousness. You can predict where it's going to go when you realize that they think this way and it's actually cartoonishly simple. It's not hard. It's not deep. They just use thousands of pages of almost impossible to read gobbledygook to explain it because it's BS. And that's exactly what you would write if you were trying to explain BS and convince people of it because it's not true. You can't just say it's this because you need a meme that's 3,000 paragraphs and a bearded guy saying, I'm not reading all that <laughs> in this opposition. So it always moves dialectically. And I've given you the big picture now, but it also always moves left. So I'll just tell you a story about that. I don't know if you know who Angela Davis is. Angela Davis is a very famous communist woman. Angela Davis is in charge of the prison abolition movement now. She's integral in K-12 education activism now. She's actually kind of big in the defund the police activism still. She is big behind Black Lives Matter. She very reluctantly supported Biden. 
said that he was probably not radical enough for her taste, but he would do. She was the critical Marxist Herbert Marcuse's PhD student in California. She was a radical black feminist. She said that Herbert Marcuse radicalized her, filled her with Marxist ideas. That was her first radicalization. Her second radicalization occurred when she visited Palestine and she became a post-colonialist. Those two ideas keep coming up when we look at this thing in the last, say, 50 years. And those are our two radicalizations. And so after all this process and maybe trying to hold up a federal judge and with a shotgun and maybe going to prison for it, and that's why she wants to abolish prisons, something like that. And then she decides this life of crime is not effective for me, so I will go into K-12 activism and ruin everybody else's life instead. Angela Davis actually did run for vice president on the Communist Party USA ticket twice. Spoiler alert, she didn't win. But she eventually left the Communist Party. Do you know why? Angela Davis said that the Communist Party USA was too conservative. So she left. It always moves left. Society doesn't always move left. Dialectical leftism moves left and drags society with it when people don't know how it works to stop it. And the right somehow has never managed to figure out how dialectical leftism works, so they have no idea what the left is doing, how the left operates, how the left moves according to a dialectical religion. And they can't stop the slow drag leftward because the center of mass on the left constantly gets dragged leftward because that's what the dialectical faith of leftism does. The goal of the dialectical faith of leftism is to identify and then seize control of the means of production of society and man so that it can drive it toward the socialist goal of an increasingly social society with a so-called perfected social contract. The word social contract, by the way, was what Rousseau called it. You heard the word that the cultural Marxists called it earlier, hegemony. You also didn't even realize that you heard the word that we use today for it, or the Democrats do, our democracy. Every time they say we have to save our democracy, they mean their cultural hegemony, their leftist vision of a perfected social contract. That's what they mean. When they come out and they say, Alex Jones, Joe Rogan, Elon Musk owning Twitter, people owning guns, social media not being under full control, yada, 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 as we heard in the news clips thing earlier, is dangerous to our democracy. Our democracy means cultural hegemony of theirs, means social contract of the dialectical faith of leftism. It means that those things are a risk to their agenda. Every time I hear a Democrat come out on stage and say, this is dangerous to our democracy, I know they mean our agenda. The social order they wish to impose on people by forcing people who wouldn't do so otherwise to give up some of their freedoms willingly so that there's a greater amount of freedom overall. Like you would give up your freedom to firearms so that people can be free not to be shot. That's exactly the argument they make about gun control. We have a freedom not to be shot, therefore you need to willingly or coercively give up some of your freedom to own arms to defend yourself against others and a tyrannical government in order to make sure that the freedom not to be shot is maintained. It's exactly the argument they make. When you understand the dialectical faith of leftism, you understand what they say, why they say it, and why, in fact, it's not crazy for them. <laughs> Imagine, for example, that you thought that the world was a prison, or in fact, that the body you were born into was a prison, and you're trapped into the body you're born into because some authority like a doctor and your parents assigned you a sex at birth and this causes you to suffer because you have to play along with this assignment that you were given because that's the order of society that was imposed on you and you didn't ask for it you were flung into it but that you could transgress that by identifying as non-binary and eventually undergoing sex change or undergoing puberty blocking which is chemical castration by lupron 
It makes sense. You could transition to rebel against that part, thus freeing up the peace of the divine trapped within your body by letting it realize its true nature, which you feel in your lived experience, and that is imprisoned in the mundane suffering world because it was imposed upon you by power that you didn't ask for, by a tyrannical God that doesn't want you to bite the fruit of the tree of knowledge and know who you really are. It is Gnostic. I read on the flight here enough queer theory to where I wished I could jump out of the plane. (laughs) I read, in fact, one of the original significant works of queer theory, which is um, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's Epistemology of the Closet. The closet, being closeted, being imprisoned in the closet, is an epistemology, is a theory of knowledge. It gives you special knowledge, special insight to suffer in the closet. You know things that people who aren't in the closet don't know. And if you bring that knowledge into the world, you can transform the world. It all makes sense when you understand that it is a cohesive theological construction based in weird, hermetic, and Gnostic mystery religions slammed together, turned into what it was turned into ultimately, which is the dialectical faith of leftism by Karl Marx. Dialectical materialism is the dialectical faith of leftism version 1.0. Cultural Marxism is 2.0. Woke is something like 7.0. It's the same thing all the way through. The goal, again, is to identify and seize the means of, uh, seize control of the means of production of society and man so that you can set man free. The way that's done is through the negative aspect of the dialectic. You have the idea and it encounters its negative in critique. That critique engenders a negative utopianism. There is a perfect world, we can obtain it, We get there by criticizing the aspects of the existing society that we wish to change. Max Horkheimer, critical theorist, 1969. He said, we invented the critical theory because we realized we cannot articulate a view of the the good society and what is right on the terms of the existing society, but we can criticize the aspects of this society that we wish to change. Herbert Marcuse, in the same year, an essay on, in his an essay on liberation, writes that negative thinking in this sort, after lots of stuff about what utopianism really means, and we'll talk about it on uh, the third lecture, says in that essay, after lots of talking about utopia, that negative thinking necessarily becomes positive because it frees the seeds of the ideal society from their constraints in the existing society. It's Gnosticism and Hermeticism rammed together. It's a religion. It thinks that through critiquing everything that exists, Marx's phrase was ruthless criticism of all that exists, that you free up the divine true nature shard that's contained within the mundane. You get the seed of gold inside of the lead. You get the seed of the ideal society blossoming out of the existing society, which is oppressive and that imprisons us. Negative utopianism, by being negative, complaining constantly, never actually knowing where you're going or how to do it, but complaining constantly about the things you don't like, that you can actually move this dialectic until it works, and we arrive at the utopia at the end of history. This is why it doesn't work. They don't have the slightest idea how anything works. They think if you just complain about the things you don't like, then you're taking the idea of what we see, you're encountering it with its negative. It's negative, therefore, creates a dialectic that then moves the whole thing around, and when you finally realize the synthesis or make it concrete, you advance society a little bit closer to the utopia. We don't know what it looks like, but you know that the dialectical spiral is shrinking, so you keep doing it, and that's the dialectical faith of leftism. If you bitch and complain enough using critical theory, the perfect society arises at the end of it. That's the faith. 
Theoretical and practical ideas make one another. They move toward synthesis, move toward one another. This awakens the absolute of Hegel, was the absolute idea. All Marx did was envision the absolute man by borrowing off of Rousseau and wishing people would give him money. This arrives us at the eschaton, the end of history, and the kingdom of God arrives here on earth, which means this is not just a theology, but it gives rise to an inherently eschatological faith where we're waiting for, but not just waiting for, but producing the end of the world and the beginning of the perfected kingdom. And like I said, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, all Marx did was import this entire religion whole cloth and then turn it material through a dialectical process while incorporating more aspects of the socialist leftism than Hegel did. Nothing else changes. So I hope, I know that was heady, I know it was deep, I know it was a lot of big words, I know we have axiologies and things happening here, but I hope we understand now that the dialectical faith of leftism is a religion, is a theology. It is a system of thought, belief, and practice because you have to do the activism to make it work that explains and gives fundamental answer or answers to the fundamental questions of life and man's role in life, that gives rise to duties of conscience to move the dialectic along through the critique. First Amendment definition of religion, satisfied. The theory behind it is a theology. It very obviously is a metaphilosophical system. We've discussed for two hours how it creates a theory of being. There's a true nature to being that we're estranged from, that we can come to know through the dialectical process. That process gives a purpose. The purpose is to resolve the dialectical contradiction until the uh, entire thing shrinks to nothing at the omega point, at which point the end of history arrives and the good actually occurs. This gives you a duty of conscience to be on the right side of history by moving it rather than the wrong side of history by resisting it or ignoring it. The special knowledge is the dialectic itself and how the dialectic progresses and that the experience of suffering from the estrangement of being gives you the insight. So it has an epistemology. As a matter of fact, Marxists don't even call it an epistemology. They call it a, I kid you not, spelled with a G, nociology, a Gnostic theory of knowledge. Which is why when I write about this a lot of times I've taken to the habit of spelling knowledge with a G instead of a K. <laughs> when I write about Marxists, they have Gnowledge, because they're Gnostics. <laughs> what brings value into the world is work that moves the dialectic, transforming aspects of nature and man toward their more social utilitarian purpose for, nature, for man and society. That gives an ethic. Like I said, the right side of history, wrong side of history. What's good and bad, right and wrong, good and evil. And it organizes a sociology, especially when it becomes leftist and organizes toward a social existence to man and a social society that's organized non-hierarchically so that we are working together to transform society to the perfect world. So a sociology is present. It's orientation toward the divine for Hegel, the absolute idea as deity. For Marx, the absolute man as the perfected being. As we go down the line, it's just different variations on the same theme. It is a theology. It's in a bunch of different species as it has evolved dialectically over time. But I hope you understand now, all the big words aside, we have satisfied the definition of theology for the dialectical faith of leftism. We understand that it arises from Hegel and Rousseau, who were synthesized properly alongside Feuerbach and Marx to create the dialectical faith of leftism. And everything woke we see today is the bastard child of that process over a century and a half. So I hope you understand more. I hope you're thinking about how the left works has changed. I hope you think that they're only one kind of crazy and that that actually doesn't make sense. And it makes sense in their world, in their theology. And if you understand that, you can make a difference with it. That was my goal and I hope I achieved it. It's late. I went five minutes over. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>